These summer Sunday mornings, we're looking at different themes from the book of Proverbs. And today our subject is wisdom's warnings. And so we turn to Proverbs chapter 5 and listen in on a conversation which King Solomon is having with his children concerning wholesome sexual relationships. So Proverbs chapter 5 and reading from verse 1. This is the word of God. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths are crooked, but she knows it not. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel, lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich another man's house. At the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or listen to my instructors. I have come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the whole assembly. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets? Your streams of water in the public squares? Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. He will die for lack of discipline, led astray by his own great folly. Amen. This morning, it's a great joy to have fellowship with one of our elders, Adam Smith, who later in the service will lead us in our intercessions. But meanwhile, he's going to bring to us our second scripture reading from the book of Proverbs on wisdom's warning. Adam. This is Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 35. This is the word of God, a warning against adultery. My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them upon your heart forever. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For these commands are a lamp. This teaching is a light. And the corrections of discipline are the way of life. Keeping you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of the wayward wife. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty, or let her captivate you with her eyes. For the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread, and the adulteress Praise upon your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? 
can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. But a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Whoever does so destroys himself. Blows and disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away. For jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will not accept any compensation. He will refuse the bribe, however great it is. Amen. Here's a question for the men. What advice did your dad give to you concerning appropriate sexual behaviour? Or a question to the women. What counsel did your mum ever give to you about relationships that are good and wholesome and life-enhancing? This morning in our series from the book of Proverbs, we're going to be thinking about King Solomon's wisdom imparted to his children on this subject of healthy relationships and sexual fidelity. Shall we pray? My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Will you please grant us the presence of the Holy Spirit as we turn now to your word? that above all else our hearts may be kept safe from harm and danger for the sake of Christ, the fountain of life. Amen. My father wasn't one for giving direct advice, certainly not about relationships, but occasionally, very occasionally, he told stories which uh, communicated important truths things that he wanted to say. Before I left home and went to university, he told me this story about a time when, as a young man, he was on holiday in the west of Ireland. He was staying in a guest house when one evening there was a knock at the door of his bedroom and an attractive young lady uh, peered in and asked if she could be of any assistance. And what did you do, I asked. I told her she had come to the wrong room. Well, that was Dad's story. His words were actually kind of timely because not many months later, something very similar happened to me, except in my context, it wasn't a stranger who came to my hall of residence door, but a paid up member of the Christian Union, of which I was also a member. This girl didn't say anything, but simply came up and, like a snake, entwined her body around mine until I had to say politely but firmly, I really think you ought to go. And it's not just men or sons that need to be on their guard against seductive behaviour, but daughters and females as well. Talking with Claire, my wife, about this, she recalled a time when, as a student on placement near London, every night the junior doctors would call at her room, not because they knew her, not because they respected her, but because, as Claire learned later, they had a competition how many attractive girls they could sleep with and add to their tally of conquests. I I tell you these stories not because either Claire or myself are unusual, but because we aren't. And just as Solomon said to his precious children in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1, my son, pay careful attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight that you may learn discretion. So it is entirely appropriate that this morning we learn from Christ 
who is our wisdom, and draw from the fountain of life. Last week, Sam very helpfully gave us the A, B, and C of wisdom. Wisdom is available to all. It brings great blessing. It calls for commitment. In other words, wisdom is something we buy into. We take ownership of it for ourselves. And this week in chapters 5 through to 7, we come across wisdom's warning. Warning about lips in chapter, three verse, chapter 5, verse 3. Lips that drip honey, but which leave an aftertaste as bitter as gall. A warning about speech. Speech that is smoother than oil, but which leaves a scar as deep as any sharp-edged double sword. And a warning about paths, verse 8. Paths that direct to a perfumed bed, but which lead to a snare. Cords of sin which bind fast and which consequences are deadly. My son, he says in chapter 4, verse 20, Pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words because they are life for those who find them and health to a man's whole body. What I want to tell you is good for you. It is for your benefit physically, emotionally, spiritually. And above all else, chapter 4, verse 23, guard your heart. Guard your heart for it is the spring of your life. Well, what does that phrase mean, guard your heart? It's a phrase we often hear, but seldom consider. Guard your heart. Well, who better to ask about that than a specialist in cardiovascular medicine? And so earlier this week, I put that question to Dr. Mark Harbinson, consultant cardiologist in the Belfast Health Trust and uh, senior lecturer at Queen's in medicine. And I asked him as a medical doctor, how can a person guard their heart? Thank you, Frank, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, In my job, it's often uh, my responsibility to talk to patients about how to guard their hearts And I'd like to talk about three aspects of that very briefly this morning. The first is a very positive message, and that is to promote and seek out behaviours which we know will be helpful for heart function and will protect the heart in the long term. These include things like eating a healthy diet with plenty of fruit and vegetables, uh, keeping uh, a healthy weight and taking regular exercise. The second uh, thing is a more negative one, and that is to avoid those things which we know are going to be harmful to the heart. And some of these are very well known, such as the dangers of cigarette smoking, of excess alcohol, and of an unhealthy diet, particularly high in sugar or in fat. The third thing which is helpful uh, is to recognize the importance of rest and recreation, trying to avoid stress and finding a good balance in life between work and other activities. So in the medical sense, it's important to guard your heart and to do this, you want to remember that you should be promoting those healthy activities which will build up your heart. You want to avoid influences and behaviors which are going to be harmful to the heart and you want to find time for rest and recreation and a balance in life. As a believer in the Lord Jesus, I believe that these things also tell us something about how to guard our hearts in a spiritual sense. So first, it's important to promote those things which we know will build us up in our faith and keep our hearts pure and clean. Second, it's important to avoid dangerous and malign influences which will push our hearts away from God. And thirdly, it's important to find time to rest in God, the creator of all things. So, 
uh, remember these three things and remember that the heart uh, should be guarded as it is the wellspring of life. Well, thank you very much indeed to Mark. Our hearts are valuable. We have two eyes so that we can still see, even if something happens to one of our eyes. We have two kidneys so that our bodies can still filter waste in case one fails. But we have only one heart. And if that goes kaput, that's it. There's not another one that can take over. And that's why we have to guard our hearts. And if guarding our hearts physically means being vigilant about keeping negative influences at bay, and guarding our hearts means being positive in seeking to strengthen it and care for it, how much more we need to guard the central core of our beings spiritually, the wellspring of our lives. And we really do need to be careful what we choose to look at, whether on our laptops or smartphones, where we choose to go, where we choose to stay or be with, how we choose to spend our time and give our resources to. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is right, whatever is pure, writes the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, whatever is noble, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And if we do, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My son, says Solomon, pay careful attention to your father's wisdom and do not forsake your mother's teaching concerning pornography infidelity, adultery. Well, now, we're nearly done, but just as we begin to draw our thoughts to a close, there's one hugely important truth I would like us to be able to think about before we conclude, and it is this. How a person orders their sexual life and practice is a barometer of how they are likely to order their spiritual life and practice. How a man or a woman chooses to live sexually is a strong indicator of the sort of relationship they have with God. Let me try to explain. When the Israelites moved from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land, they were ordered to destroy the images of Baal, that is, those man-made pagan fertility deities. They were ordered to pull down the Ashtaroth poles, which were the female equivalent to the Baal statues. Why? Because these whimsical, capricious, unpredictable fertility deities had temples or shrines where people were encouraged to participate in sexual activity with temple prostitutes. How you think about God influences your attitude to sex. And the prophet said, no, don't be part of Baal or Ashtoreth worship. The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob is not like that. The God of Israel is not capricious or unpredictable or whimsical. Our God is relational. He is faithful. He is trustworthy. He is true. Our God is one who has entered into a covenant of love with his people, and we are his spouse. And so is an expression of God's relationship with us, which is wholesome, faithful, and true. When we copy him in our sexual activity and relationships, that is key. Now, fast forward, if you will, from the Old Testament and the book of Numbers to the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and to a city in which in the Apostles' day there was a temple which loomed high over the city of Corinth dedicated to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Do you not know, says Paul to the Christians in Corinth, 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 16. Do you not know that a person who unites themselves with a prostitute becomes one with their body? Do you not realize that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Flee from sexual immorality, which the apostle says to the Christians in, in Corinth is key to your spiritual development. Do you not know, he says, that your body is a temple to the Holy Spirit? You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Honor God with your body. What we think about God determines our sexual practice. How a woman or how a man chooses to live sexually is a strong indicator of the sort of relationship they have with God. When Claire and I got married, at our wedding ceremony, the groom had to say these words to the bride. With this ring I thee wed, with my body I thee worship, and all my worldly goods I with thee share. I'm not sure I really understood that line, with my body I thee worship. But it makes sense now, because the sexual act is designed by God to be a deeply spiritual activity. It is a form of worship. And that's why Solomon in Proverbs 5 through to 7 so strongly steers his sons away from adultery. Because for the believer in the Lord Jesus, these things can never deliver. Immoral behavior, prostitution, however exciting they may be, they cannot satisfy. They will fall far short of what God has designed. Sexual intercourse is a form of worship which expresses, encompasses body and mind and spirit that expresses what we understand about God and his faithfulness towards us. Believing people then must not worship in the temple of Baal or Ashtoreth or Aphrodite, because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And so when this morning in the book of Proverbs we read wisdom's advice concerning sex, it's not to spoil, it is to prevent spoiling. It is not to spurn sexual enjoyment, rather it is to enhance sexual fulfillment. For some for many, I hope this will be an enormous encouragement to be people of wholesomeness, integrity, and total integration. But I'm conscious that for others, this teaching will have only highlighted feelings of sadness or regret or guilt. Well, if that is the case, please know that that is not the will of our loving Heavenly Father. Our God is one who delights to cleanse, to renew, to make whole. Our God is a God who washes us clean from all our mistakes, our sins, our regrets. Please know that the Lord Jesus, the perfectly clean and pure and righteous one, has died on the cross to atone for all our wrongs. Please know that the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, has shed his blood so that we can be washed clean from the destructive power and negative influence of guilt and shame and set free for a life of blessing to others and peace. Let us pray. Just follow your heart. Listen to your heart. They have a good heart. Lord, our culture bombards us with false messages about our hearts. This morning, 
We acknowledge the truth of your word that says the heart is deceitful above all things. And so we pray for your help in cleansing and guarding our hearts from unrighteousness. We pray that you would create a new heart within us, one that turns towards your life-giving promises and away from the sin that leads to emptiness and ultimately to death. Your word tells us that David was a man after your own heart. Our prayer for Bloomfield is that for young and old, men and women, boys and girls, our hearts would seek out what you want for us and what will build your kingdom and glorify you. Keep us from temptation, Lord. Help us to be on our guard. The devil loves nothing more than to offer us pale imitations of fulfillment and joy. And for any of us struggling this morning with the mistakes and failures we've made in the past, Help us always to remember that you sent a lamb. You sent us your son to pay the price for our crimes against you. As Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. May we know this morning, deep in our hearts, the liberation, peace, freedom and joy that comes from the realisation that for those who are in Christ, you do not even remember the wrongs that we have done. We also acknowledge, Lord, that sometimes our hearts are troubled and fearful. Help us to remember that your perfect love casts out all fear. You're not an impersonal God who sits in the sky, detached and aloof. You are our Heavenly Father who loves us and wants the best for us. What an amazing thing that we can be known and loved by you, the very creator of the universe and life itself. Help those who are fearful of what is happening in the world around us to remember that they serve a ruler who is both king and father. Lord, may we also share the love that you have shown towards us in our families, communities and workplaces. Sometimes, Lord, it is hard to love people as we should, especially when they're different from us and might even hate us for what we believe. And Lord, we are so self-centred. We do not invest in other people's lives in the way that we should. We are so comfortable. And though we pay lip service to your importance in our lives, deep down, we think we're self-sufficient and can run our own lives. How much anxiety comes from not letting you have your way. Give us more stamina to love others and more courage as we seek to live out the Christian life in this dark world. We pray too for those whose hearts are troubled by illness or the illnesses of people they love, for those who are in hospital, for those who are shielding, for those who are fearful for their jobs and businesses, for those who are uncertain about the future of their education. May they know the peace and assurance that comes from knowing they follow the Good Shepherd who guides sustains and rescues. Lord, we love to worship you and we long to be back together in one place. Help us to be patient and give wisdom to those elders working on preparing the way for a return to corporate worship. Thank you that we've been able to meet online throughout the pandemic and we pray for those who don't normally come to Bloomfield on a Sunday but who have joined our live streamed services. May they be blessed by taking part. We especially remember our sister Helen in Sapporo and pray her heart would be encouraged by knowing she is loved and prayed for by her friends here in East Belfast. Lord, many years ago, one of your servants said a very wise thing. He said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. May we all know afresh this morning the joy and peace that comes from giving our hearts and lives to you and experiencing your peace. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen.